Hi team, welcome to 10 Talks. Today's conversation is continuation of really exploring what is bias, why do we do it, what is it, how more importantly do we really recognize it and do something with it. We want to be champions for change. So thank you for listening to us. Thank you for joining us on this journey of discovery. We are hosting this really as a think tank. We really want to understand Tom is our educator. He is educating us. I am curious and I'm bringing up really our clientele. We want to talk about how does it affect athletes, college athletes? How does it affect college coaches? What do we do from an administration perspective? We've been really figuring out solutions, ideas, and now I just want to go to really that conversation of women to women, just the gender bias that happens inside leadership for women. So, Tom, thank you so much for being our educator and mainly for just your passion for caring deeply about this and for being on the journey with us to really become these champions for change and help women really set women up for great success. Oh, glad to be here, Carlette. Thanks again for having me. And I'm glad to go down this road with you and everyone listening. It's an important issue and, and it's, a, it's a challenging one. So it's just the more people can get their mind around it and educate the more, the sooner we can maybe start to fix some of these issues that cause harm that we really don't intend. What are the biases that women can be aware of and really recognize when they show up? I think that, as I've mentioned before, one of the methodologies I use to try and get one's mind around a systemic problem, right? The how do you solve the problem of implicit bias in policing with shootings and the reactions and protests and the emotions? It's very difficult to do. Gender is slightly easier, but still very difficult because there's a lot of defensiveness and emotion that surrounds it. So how can you take kind of charge of it? And I believe to answer to your question is that you have to focus in on the types of biases that are most likely to occur right? Where are women most likely going to be judged in a very specific way in the workplace? And it's mm -hmm. one is sexuality as sex objects, how you look, how you dress. That's one. Two, family, family care, being more moms and more needing to pay attention to your kids more than being focused on your career. And the third one is in leadership roles. And I focus on leadership because that relates to the coaching issues I deal with, but also generally for women in leadership roles in other types of professions. The idea that a woman, once she steps into the role of a police officer, a lawyer, a doctor, a CEO, uh, a sports agent, um, uh, you know, a Wall Street executive, these male type roles, or a violinist apparently is a male type role, they're just, there's this lack of fit. And this is a huge source of bias that is just tamping down women and just that creates that glass ceiling is what it really does. Or if you get through the glass ceiling, it creates that resistance, that double standard. So a woman, so as women, those are the areas you need to watch out for. If you're in a workplace where men are not ogling you, they've got your harassment training under control, men treat you with respect, no one's using any kind of sexual misbehavior. Great. You've kind of solved the sexualized problem or at least got it under control. And then, and, but, but still in those environments, you're going to have a risk that of leadership bias. So as a female, if I'm in a um, customer service role or non-managerial role, or even a very, very low level supervisory role, my concerns will be sexualization or family care. Okay. That's where the biases will affect me. But once I step up into higher level supervisor, manager, director, VP, you know, all those roles up above as you go up the chain, the risks of implicit bias for leadership affecting the evaluation of you starts to become a risk. So if you're aware of these as a woman, you can start to watch out for it. And as an organization, you know, if you're advising organizations, Carlette, in terms of how you help, you know, remove, remove barriers for women in a reasonable way, say you look out for the same thing. These are where the biases will likely hit women um, it's not that they're not other biases. I mean, there can be, but generally those are the big three in my view. And they affect, you know, if you can get your brain around those areas and get those things kind of watch out for those risk points, it can really help you, um, you know, allow women to move up in the chain. But also one of the other problems here, Carlette, is not just getting a woman through the glass ceiling, but once they're there, you know, 
what happens is, is that the doubt that resisted them getting into that through that glass ceiling is still there. Right. They didn't get through and all of a sudden magically everyone mm -hmm. thinks women are perfectly equal at a subconscious level. They're still there, which means that we're more sensitive to their failures, to their mistakes. Um, we're doubting why they're there. Like, and so therefore, if, the, if you make an honest mistake as a woman, you're going to be maybe picked up on, judged a little more quickly, or you're not making a mistake. People still find fault, or if you, or if you're being very successful, it may be that the reaction of people around you is muted. You don't really appreciate the success, or the ingenuity, or the brilliance um, of a female in quite the same way. And women have to deal with all of these things. So those are just a. Uh, it seems complicated, but actually, I try and simplify it. It's one, two, three. Understand leadership bias, and I think that women will make strong strides if they can get themselves and their organizations around those three issues. So if I were to recognize that there was a family bias, the fact that I would have children and so I may be considered that I can't travel or I'm not as responsive or whatever. Once I sense that, what is the action to change that I take? I think that the, um, as in any situation, you have to find the individual in the organization. I must now let's just talk about for a moment a fairly large employer organization that is somewhat sophisticated. Okay, I'm not going to be able to talk about how you address it at Joe's Plumbing Shop right. or even the local law firm with two lawyers in it. Right. You know, theoretically, they should know better, but it just they don't have the systems in place. They don't have HR departments in place. They don't have the training in place. It's it's more difficult to deal with it. But in a large organization where there's sophisticated HR departments and training, et cetera, you know, you need to use the policies that exist, of course, that's common sense to so go follow the policies, but you've got to find, I think, ways to talk about it with managers, to people who are your peers and people above you that doesn't trigger defensiveness, mm -hmm. right? That's it's hard though, but you can say things like, you know, hey, I'm, you know, I, I'm a little concerned that my, for example, I just had a baby. All right, I just had a baby. I'm a little concerned that um, that I, people may be perceiving me slightly differently. You know, I'm ready to be here. I'm going to be here. I believe in this organization. I can be a mom and a, and a manager too. I think you've got to be able to have those conversations. I think that 15 years ago, that conversation could have risked much stronger defensiveness and negative reaction, even in a professional organization. I think today, you can have those conversations, especially if you're not framing it as, you know, you don't like me because I'm a mom. You know, I mean, that's what you don't do. Uh, but there's no perfect way to do it, Carleth. There's no sure, no for sure. And so you've got to make certain that your organization is providing the training and using the the uh, the other way to do it. You could go to HR and say, "Look, I think there's an issue here. I don't want to make a big deal out of it because it's not a problem yet. But perhaps when we update our training, could you offer some additional examples of women who are successful despite having children and being successful in the work of a female to give the people around me more context for this without them being, you know, specifically questioned about whether they like me because I just had a baby because I'm not being demoted and not being not fired. I'm just worried that it's affecting the evaluation of me. So let's deal with it kind of in the back channel way. So there's a couple different ways that someone could, could try to address it. So Tom, as I listen to you, you know, Kathy and I are writing a book called How Women Win, and, and we've subtitled that with a, our way. We really want to figure out how to do it our way. And mm. what I'm really curious about is how do we, again, find the win-win? Like when I think about having to go to human resource, or I even bring up, I'm curious about this. I don't want anyone to be put off in a way that they feel like I'm attacking them or because I really believe people are doing the best they can. We all have great intentions. Like, <clears throat> you know, we're not against each other. We're just all wanting to figure out how do we get along? How do we optimally perform? How do we be competitively great? And I love the fact that we're challenging all of our belief systems and we're challenging the way we respond to each other. So I really like to work internally in terms of how do I present myself with strength and come from a place that there's not even going to be a question that shows up. I mean, is that possible or is there so much bias just because I'm a woman that has children that immediately I walk in and they think I can't perform. The secret is that if, if a woman does everything right, the biases still can interfere with the evaluation of her. But 
everything you're saying, everything you're telling your audience, everything you're coaching your individual women that you talk to to do is, of course, perfectly appropriate, powerful, um, helpful, and arming them against this these biases and others challenges they may face. You know, there's only two ways to do it, only a couple of ways to do it, which is the let me move forward in a positive, aggressive, direct, direct way. Let's be positive. Let's, let's show people I can do this. Let's not let it get me down. But that will eventually hit a wall at some point because the biases can stop you. Not always, but sometimes. And the other way to do it then, of course, is the training, awareness, education to kind of remove those barriers while you're trying to kind of push your way through them. So let's start with our athletes and, and just have new hope that they're a new gen They've really recognized, wow, I had no idea that I, as an athlete, had implicit bias towards my female coach. Okay. Now, through my education, I feel, I recognize that when my identity is challenged, when I am under stress, when I am having to perform at a level that's uncomfortable, I resist taking responsibility myself, not because I'm not a responsible human being. It's that I haven't messed with this before. I was a superstar 15 minutes ago before I got to college. And now that I'm at college, I'm getting challenged in so many ways. So we've now brought that education to our awareness. And I'm incredibly grateful that the athletes that I know and the, the space I get to work in, when they get educated, they're coachable. They're like, okay, great. We didn't even know we were doing that. So we have educated on identity management. Now we've recognized and said, I'm being threatened. My identity is being threatened. I'm figuring out social media. I'm creating a story around why I'm not playing or why this is happening. And my first response is to attack my coach. We're going to say, time out. Next play is instead of attacking the coach, I'm going to own my feelings. I'm going to own that I'm feeling challenged. I'm going to recognize what's being triggered inside of me. And I'm going to talk to a counselor or a coach or, you know, a sports life coach or, you know, somebody that can introduce the fact that we're looking for a win, 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 rather than it be your right, the athlete's right, go attack the coach. I would be so grateful if attacking anyone got taken off the table and everything that stayed on the table was, we're going to team up together and figure this out. So I've laid that groundwork for our future to be that the athlete is educated on recognizing the red flags that are basically showing up. Now I've got a red flag beeping in front of me in a huge way. What do I do with it? I just want to note for your audience that what you just laid out is an excellent approach to beginning to educate these athletes in the way you just suggested. That's an excellent way to do it. If there's a red flag and, and we're if it's a red flag flag in place, meaning the athlete is injured, for example, has had a bad reaction to uh, a feeling a feeling of shame that they talked about my fitness. I think that people think I'm fat, or I feel that I'm having some depression. I think that the athlete, of course, if they've been trained appropriately on the things you just mentioned, they've got to have a process in place so they can they can they can bring bring themselves back to that moment. For example, and if they want to feel like complaining, they have to have reminders along the way. Like for example, it's kind of on the coach a little bit and the administration to remind the athlete of the things you just mentioned, Carlette, not just at the beginning of the season, but hey, you're dealing with fitness here. Remember, remember. This is division one athletics. We're having a conversation about fitness. No one's shaming you. You have a reminder for the athlete themselves. If, they, if you're asking, what does the athlete do if they're going down the, the rabbit hole of depression and self-doubt and worry? I don't know that I have the answer to that question. I don't think anybody does. I think that it's a, I think that the win-win you're looking for is the description that you just, just that you just laid out of how the athlete needs to be educated and informed, number one. And that's going to be so much better than it was before that that's a, a great step forward. Then the athlete is protected by those around her. The, for example, the policy she must follow. If I'm writing up a, a complaint about my coach, I can't believe that she called, she thinks I'm fat and disgusting. I can't believe this. This is abuse. And I'm going down this hole and I've got to be able to sit down for a minute, take a breath, write out exactly what it is. Well, wait a minute. Did she actually call me fat? I guess she didn't call me fat. She just said, 
I needed to be able to move faster down the field. And I know that I'm 10 pounds heavier than it was last season. I know that it's not her fault, but I have to, do I blame her for that? I mean, the process of writing it out, Carlette, actually can create a pause, a moment, a breath for someone who may be going that rabbit hole. And so to some extent, there isn't any way, in my opinion, for the individual athlete to just stop herself if she's thinking of all the things you just identified. But I think the process can help her stop herself through the policies we've talked about before, the accountability we've talked about before, and or the coach issuing a reminder or someone around her issuing a reminder about the fact that this is not a personal thing. Fitness is not personal. Uh, the, the, the injury is not personal. It feels personal, but it's not. So those are just, that's what I would suggest. So that's for our athlete. So we've got our athlete coached up. We're giving her reminders constantly. We're basically training her to change, to mm -hmm. really recognize the biases that are showing up, to take responsibility for emotional management. I mean, all of this is high EQ. This is definitely a whole nother level, but you know what? Women are ready for it. So go us, totally ready for that. So next level is just that awareness. Now let's go to the coach. So the coach is starting to do all the things we've talked about, do the reminders for the athletes, be intentional with their tone, the way they're doing it, recognizing that as a female leader, I'm supposed to be a nurturer because that's just the bias that is placed on me. Female equals nurture. So when I get strong or when I maybe am not nurturing and I'm pushing, what does a coach do when the red flag shows up and that she recognizes that people may be biased against her? I believe that the other than hoping that the university has a policy in place and has some of the training you've mentioned earlier, Carlette, in place, other than that, in the moment, in the season, the coach needs to think about where are my high risk points here? Injury, food and fitness, mental health, you know, perceptions of favoritism, et cetera. So you can issue reminders. You can, first of all, you can remind the athlete of expectations. Like for example, if there's an injury and I think that, you know, I can preempt it a little bit. I can say, hey, you've had an injury here. Remember, remember athlete Sally Smith, that, that I'm concerned about you and your injury. Of course I am. But remember, I have limitations as a coach of how I can respond to this injury. It's not my, I can't do what I could do if I was your parent. I can't do it. You have the administration, you have medical, you have trainings. They're responsible for you now, but so don't forget that. So when you see me being distant, et cetera, I'm not rejecting you. I'm not blaming you. The injury is what it is. It's not personal. Just don't forget that. You'll come back to the team. We'll welcome you back. But remember, I have limits. So reminding them that the coach has limitations on her ability to do the things the athlete wishes she would do. Just remember that I need to be able to Food and fitness. Remember, this is an athletic program. I have to be able to manage um, one's ability for speed, for energy, for strength. Do we agree with that. I mean, there's nothing. Are you okay with this conversation? I think you've got to preempt it in those high risk points. If you sense that the athlete is going down the hill and down the rabbit hole, you said, well, I, they had an injury. There's something issues. There's a personal issue. All you can do then is I think is direct them to other resources as best you can, or go talk to the other, you know, the team captain or the assistant coach generally who might have a better ear to the ground on it to try and see if you need to pay attention to it. But again, what I say is that one of the challenges of this, Carla, and the thing I'm trying to avoid here is that I don't want a coach who's already overwhelmed, especially a female coach, to feel that she has to be so on every five seconds for every possible emotional reaction of an athlete that she can't do her job. Women are already almost there. So to some extent, you increasing and watching for those like key trigger points, food, fitness, injury, things like that are one thing. But at some point after that, you just have to do your job and trust that the protocols are in place and the policies are in place in case you miss something and keep your ear to the ground. Otherwise, you've got to be able to do your job. Otherwise, you know, you sh shouldn't be in that profession. But that's that's the best I can suggest. Tom, what's really encouraging for me as we just get educated on this, listen for solutions, really commit to being champions for change, is that it's actually, it could be easier on us as women if we really stopped trying to be all things to all people. And I'm speaking mm -hmm. as a woman, right? As I listen to you and you say, look, 
Let them know that you're not the doctor. Let them know you're not the mental health coach. Let them know you're not the fitness person. Let them know you're not the trainer. Let them know like, yeah, what a, a freedom that is for us to be able to come in and just do our job and say, my job as a sport coach is to get you to be the best athlete that you can be and for our team to perform at the highest level. We have all these other resources for you to engage in based on what you need to be set up for great success. And when I think about doing that, I can feel the pressure of myself just like, wow, how great for administration and, and everybody to feel that we're in this together, there's our win, win, win. And it's not that the coach is responsible for all of it, but it's that this team approach is the, the, the win for all of us. The power of team, really igniting yeah. it. And, you know, have your sports psych, have your nutritionist, have all of these people. I mean, what a gift to give an athlete to say, here's your team. Now you are empowered to access them. Mm -hmm. And what I need from you is for you to access your resources so that when you show up for me for two hours a day or three hours a day, you're ready to be the athlete that I need you to do. To me, when I hear that, it's very professional. So it gives us the opportunity to really train young women to be professional and to show up at your job, committed to performing and to take care of the things personally that you need to take care of away from sport that set you up for success, sleep, eat, relationships, mm -hmm. really, you know, college, you know, academics when you're at school. I mean, there's so many things. And as I just listened to you, I think, wow, it would be common. That's not a fabulous statement to say from a woman's perspective, but that with our desire to nurture we take on too much and that's where it breaks is that we're not able to nurture because we're playing too many roles. So could we be set up to win as women if we were clear on our role and we showed up and we delivered our role and then from an identity management perspective, as a coach, I'm not wrapped up in my identity being that I'm taking care of your mental health, that I'm taking care of your well being, that I'm doing all these things. I'm not trained as a sport coach to be a yeah. psych, to be a counselor, to even be a mom. Some people aren't even moms. I mean, there's just, you know, so as I listen to you, that's the message I'd like for us to give a try is just women, let's be for us. Let's take off our capes, right? Really put them down and say, wow, what a gift to free ourselves up to do what we're hired to do and to have those clear descriptions, have intentional conversations that are very clear about expectations with a support team with numbers listed and how to access them so that we empower our athletes to do that. And I feel like that's the beginning of a win for an athlete, a win mm -hmm. for a coach and a win for administration. And if we take it even further into a corporate setting, learning from sport, which is what we love to do. And our work is to really have these two worlds be able to come together for optimum performance is okay. We can learn that women inside the workforce need to have time to get their work done and do what they need to do. We don't necessarily have to be the one taking on ordering lunch and taking on all the different components that go into our nurturing DNA. Absolutely. I think that the idea of the team approach to solving some of the problems we've been discussing and to include and train the athlete and the coach, that the team is broader than the coach mm -hmm. and the assistant coach. It includes the trainer. It includes the academic advisor. It includes the potentially the sports psychologist or the access to counseling and mental health. It includes the um, other individuals who can then and then training the athletes that these individuals have specific roles to play on the team. Therefore, that can be thinking of it, oh, I'm not looking at my coach to be all things to all people and all human beings in the universe. I'm realizing just like the, I know the assistant coach has a role. I know that the trainer has a role. I know that the counselor has a role if I need that person. So I think that's a great idea. Um, and I think that's 
that's and then if you can incorporate that into the the university organization being part of the team well in terms of designing the training and the policies that support and surround the team i think that's a great way to start to approach this difficult thing to create that win-win you're looking for well tom thank you very much for educating us team we've got some work to do like wow this is a lot tom you've said that over and over <laughs> and we totally we respect it. I just, you know, as a woman and, and having three daughters, this is near and dear to my heart. And I'm so grateful for your work and your research. And I'm going to challenge us because you know what, when you challenge women to fi figure out a solution, nothing holds us back. And we're brilliant, by the way. And you know what, I love that. And so are men. I am a huge fan of teaming up. And that's what's so important is that I really want to recognize it isn't an either or. I love the fact that you and I, Tom, we're in this together. We're figuring it out. And I want to encourage others when we say, let's start to figure it out. Get that think tank together. Get that group of athletes together. Have them come up with what they need. Get the coaches together. Have them come up with their winning strategies, the ideas for policies, what they would like written in. This is a team. We know team. We know the power of team. Let's do this to really beat implicit bias. That's our competitor, not each other. That's the gift is that we are for each other in such a heartfelt connection in such a way that we're going to do this. So Tom, we know it's the beginning. We greatly appreciate you being a champion for our change and team. It's up to us. Let's go out and win against implicit bias, mainly by getting educated thinking about solutions, being part of the solution as a champion for change. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Colette.